Security report says over 3,000 persons have been abducted and 654 million naira ransom paid between 2021 and 2022. Terrorists have attacked Southern Kaduna community again 24 hours after residents conducted a mass burial. Tonight, in continuation of our town hall series and countdown to the 2023 elections, we take a look at the worsening security situation, even as Nigerians call for speedy justice for the late lawyer Omobolani Rahim, who was shot dead on Christmas Day by a police officer in Lagos. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anakom. Between 2021 and 2022 alone, no fewer than 3,420 persons have been abducted across Nigeria, with 564 others killed in violence associated with abductions. Terrorists on Friday uh, also launched a fresh attack in Malagom Kagoro in Kaura local government area of Kaduna State, 24 hours after a mass burial of victims killed in previous terrorist attacks. According to sources in the community, the terrorists arrived fully armed and began shooting, forcing people to flee for their lives. Now, recently, we have had an incident of the killing of a Lagos lawyer, Mrs. Bolanle Rahim, by a police officer in the state. Rahim was hit by a bullet fired by a police officer attached to the Ajiwe police station in Aja uh, Jambi Van Vandi, an assistant superintendent of police on Christmas Day. Uh, it is no hidden fact that incidences of kidnapping and banditry and police brutality have become more brazen under the Buhari administration. From abducting a military officer from a military facility to attacking an airport, derailing a train and kidnapping passengers, the safety of the average Nigerian cannot be assured. Well, joining us to discuss this is Reverend Joseph Hayab, he's the chairman, Christian Association of Nigeria, Kaduna State. We're also being joined by Dennis Amakri, former assistant director of of the DSS and Senator Iriogbu, he's the editor in chief, Global Sentinel, and he's also a security analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, uh, for joining us on this conversation and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Great. I'm going to start. Thank you for having us. Great. I'm going to start with Reverend Hyde because of you know the recent attacks again in Kaduna State, which seems to uh, not be going away uh, anytime soon. Um, Reverend Hayab, Nigeria is being ranked as um, the sixth terrorism um, in most impacted country um, you know, this year. And as we can see, um, Nigeria is leading countries like Syria and Somalia. And these are countries who have been actively um, at war. Um, but, and, here, and here in your state, which supposedly uh, would not be necessarily seen as a very Islamic state, we're seeing more and more of these killings along the lines of religion and ethnicity. Why has the situation in Kaduna State continuously lingered? It will interest you to know that the situation in Kaduna, the truth is that it's even underreported. Because uh, you are just talking about the killings in uh, Malagun, Kaura local government of Kaduna State that happened some days ago. But I can tell you that on the 25th of December, just on Christmas night, another person was killed in a village by name Amfani Umoru. And one Maradona Samuel was badly injured. And over 18 people were kidnapped on that Christmas day in Kaduna local government of Kaduna State. On the 26th, again, these dreaded kidnappers came and took away 42 persons. 39 of them were women in one community called Umbwampa in Kasoma, the new world. So you can see that killings, attack, kidnappings, and all form of insecurity is still going on. The reason why we are just tired of coming every day to the media to sing this song, to continue to explain this. Yesterday morning, precisely, I was in Zonkwa and I was in Kaburu, I was in Kapanchan because I have to go. I went to Southern Kaduna to 
commiserate with many of the families that we are actually affected. Mm -hmm. And the stories are not good stories at all. Do you know that the very night we buried, we had that mass burial, on that night, this killer man came again. And to show you that they can dear everybody, they will even go beyond what you think they will go. So when you are asking about the state of Nigeria, it's just to tell you that things have continued to deteriorate. There is no control. Insecurity has reached the worst level it should not be in this country. Either because there is a failure in government to deal with this matter decisively, or we are playing politics with a very sensitive matter. The rating may not even be a concern of this government because before you know what is happening, Lai Mohammed will come, address the press, and even accuse some people of asking this rate or to have rated Nigeria as higher in uh, in killings than Syria and Somalia. So that's the problem we have in Nigeria. Those even in charge don't even feel any concern about what is happening. They give it a different name, they try to turn their face to the story. And so the enemies of the country will continue to perpetuate evil because they know that no one is going to come after them. I'm most curious about the fact that, I mean, of course, a lot of people make the excuse that uh, the governor of a state is just the chief um, security officer on paper and not necessarily by action or, uh, you know, being able to command, you know, the service chiefs in the state. Um, but if something of this nature happened on Christmas Day and the same night, something of the same nature was able to happen. It makes me wonder where security agencies in Kaduna State are, especially for a place that's gradually become a hotbed for some of these killings um, and, and, you know, abductions. I'm, I'm curious because I want to know, where are security agencies in your state and what's the situation? What is the police commissioner saying and other security agencies that are supposed to be on ground to help fight this um, killers off? This question should go to the Commissioner of Police, the or the security agencies in Kaduna State, not me. My role simply is as a faith leader, my people call me every night and every hour when they are in crisis, when they are in a difficult situation like this, and tell me. And they will write a vivid report. I can, because it's not here, it's not a place for me to begin to. I can tell you with the names of people kidnapped, the names of people injured, the names of people died, and the timing. I have all those ones on record because can have a network that goes beyond just a state a chapter. We have chapters in the local government. We have chapters in the... I think we're, I think we're having a connection issue there with and you, Reverend Hyatt. Some of them oh. an incident that will pass this report to us. I will report to us what they are doing. But we are really disappointed that nothing serious is happening. Okay, let me come to you. Um, Mr. Macri, of course, um, you, you are retired, but uh, you obviously are still a security consultant. I feel like every time we have these conversations, we're just talking about the same thing again and again and again, and there seems to be um, no end in sight. It, it, it looks like we're going round and round in circles, and maybe the answers are staring us right in the face, and we're not necessarily doing what we need to do, because I'm trying, I'm, this is my question. Why do we have to keep doing this time and time again, even when there seems to be some solution? There are ideas that people like you put out there. What do you think the challenge is with this issue of insecurity, especially for a case like Southern Kaduna? Okay, uh, thank you very much for having me. And um, you see, this problem keep on persisting because we have not seriously decided to solve it. Um, you, you, you have uh, uh, people dying every day, uh, you have uh, uh, governors doing a double speak, you know, about uh, when people are killed, they come and make political statements, uh, when it favors them, they are ready to give all kinds of uh, military solutions, intelligence solutions, you know, when it doesn't favor them. They tell you that they are not the CSO, they are just CSOs on paper and stuff like that. Because when you, when you look at it, um, these governors actually have the security apparatus under them. He is not a commander, he is just the chairman of the security council where he should be able to direct people to do certain things. You know, and when your own people keep on dying and um, 
you, you make political statements, it shows that you are not really serious about what is going on. But I, I think um, we've experienced a lot of things this year, uh, very, very nasty situations. And uh, as we move into the next year, optimistically, maybe we will think that, you know, new things will happen. Hmm. Uh, Senator, you have continuously reported on issues of insecurity across the country, especially in the northern part uh, of the country. I mean, terrorism continues to be on the rise. And I, when I talk about terrorism, I'm not just talking about banditry or Boko Haram. I'm talking about terrorism in its entirety. Uh, crime and criminality seems to be on the rise, despite the fact that the Nigerian government had budgeted 11 trillion, 11 point 18 trillion naira, um, you know, from 2015 to 2022, um, you know, to fight this menace. And terrorism, if I might add, is one of the major uh, wings on which this government rode into power. And we're here almost at the end of 2022, still deliberating on what needs to be done. And I'm wondering, from your experience in the field, what exactly um, do you think the challenge is? Uh, from my perspective, I think the challenge first uh, starts from the top. Um, they say we practice uh, executive uh, presidency. And um, if you remove dictators all over the world, if you remove dictators, uh, I think Nigerian presidency, the power inherent in Nigerian presidency, uh, makes it one of the most powerful in the world. In fact, almost close to a dictator. Now, to whom much is given, much is expected. That's how the country is built. Is the commander in chief of uh, the president and commander in chief of the armed forces. So, when a president is not leading from the front or taking, you know, um, uh, direct charge, it becomes a problem. Uh, I think half of these issues. Stem from there. Most times, uh, the we are always talk about body language. Most times, what we get from there is that sometimes he is nonchalant about some of these issues, yes. and it's uh, a shame actually because this presidency has one of the most uh, enormous goodwill out of many presidents we have ever had. It had so much goodwill when the president took over. But over time, this frittered away, and it continues up to now. Believe you me, any time this president is interested in an issue, you will see that it will be done. If, is, this, is this not the same country that um, uh, security and intelligence agencies will go up to a, a place like Kenya and took somebody of interest and brought the person back to Nigeria to face charges, go to Benin Republic, bring the person to face charges, you know? Because why? The president is interested in such issue. And this, this kind of operation is something that top, like CIA, Mossad, they, they put it up. So what I'm saying is that the president should take charge. It's in this country where about almost 1,000 people were killed in Agatu. For almost two weeks, Nigerians were crying. President, say something. Speak. Address these people. At least assuage their plight. No comment. No statement. After so much pressure, then uh, Femi Adesina issued a, a president. At the same time, this was after uh, there was a, a bombing in Brussels, Belgium. We had few people, about nine people were killed by terrorists. Immediately, in less than 24 hours, presidents issued a statement commiserating with the people of um, um, Belgium. It's the same country where flood, flood submerge almost one third of Bayesa state, submerge almost one fourth of Anamba, submerge almost one fifth of Kogi. Across the country, all over, from Jigawa to no statement from. In fact, federal government were incommunicated. Then there was this uh, Halloween um, stampede of firebreak in Korea, where 
about 100 people immediately. So what I'm saying is, if, it is, if, if, if a situation gets back from the head, then, then that's where they stop. And take note that most of these operations is a command and control structure. Mm -hmm. If they are not sure, if the military or security agencies don't have a defined directive, there's little or nothing they can do because it creates a situation of uncertainty. And that's what you are seeing in the Northwest and across the country, except Northeast, where there is a defined operation going on in Northeast, where there is theater command, where we know that the sphere of operation is well defined. Their mandate are defined. And that's where you are gradually getting results. We are not yet there. But apart from that, across the country, be it in Kaduna, be it in Kasina, be it even in the southeast, everywhere, there's no defined operation. Most times it depends if you are the presence, okay, I've given command to the military. If you give command, how do you follow it up? That's right. If, if something goes wrong, who do you hold responsible? Did you sack anybody? It's in this country that President confessed his told ID, IG to go to Benway State, and he didn't know that IG didn't go. That was it. He didn't do anything. In fact, that IG stayed and tried to even defy the Constitution to stay beyond the constitutional date. He's supposed to retire. So, 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 Senator, you're saying all of these things to say that our president, I want to be sure, that you're saying that Mr. President does yes, not seem to be in charge. Down. It can down. I want to first lay a foundation from there, because if we are going to solve other things, like the issue of the non-kinetic areas, like having the political will, it starts from there. Mm. Having Because some of these issues we are talking will not stop by guns and bullets. Mm -hmm. There has to be a political solution like you know restructuring our political architecture like our policing system is over centralized but if we are to take action we have to start from the top president has initiated and approach national assembly and state house of assembly and governors and he has to start from there he has to mobilize because enormous power and influence is in that office okay if he's not interested in doing anything i bet you other things, other sectors, other arms may try, but it is still for short. So the emphasis, why I'm laying emphasis there is because there's enormous power and influence from there. He's not going to do it alone, but he has to initiate it. He has to follow up. Hmm. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So there, there are other areas of, you know, decentralizing our poli uh, policing structure, having community policing, early warning, early re effective early warning, early response system, you know, having okay. a national dialogue to know how we can live in peace. Because some of these problems are actually politically inclined. Mm. If we solve it, then we solve almost 60 to 70%. But okay. it has to come from the top, the initiation. Someone has to lead to get these things to be done. Okay. And it has to start from the top. Okay. All right. Let me come back to you, Reverend Hayek, because, you know, the Christian Association is not just an association of, you know, Christians. You obviously also, um, you know, represent, you know, um, Christians and you speak along those lines. You liaise with governments and, you know, security agencies. So picking up from where um, Senator left up, uh, Senator is saying that, there seems to be a lack of leadership push on Mr. President's part. He's saying he's not doing his job. His body language, for the want of a better word, way to describe it, does not show that he's interested in fighting, um, you know, insecurity. But it, it baffles me for a president who fought so hard to be president in this country so many times, the fourth time finally, he was able to get his way. And then this is what we get. It beats me. Why has it taken so long for the president to deal with this issue of insecurity? And he talked about politicizing it. Uh, do you see any form of politicization when it comes to dealing with insecurity across the different zones in the country? Uh, the truth is that the reason why we've not been able to tackle insecurity is the politicization of the insecurity. Apart from, you see, I, I like using Kaduna State, for instance. In Kaduna State, most time our governor will come out to the media and say things that are not, just to divert attention. Do you remember that on the eve of one election in this country, 
this governor came out just to divert attention and claim that certain ethnic groups have been killed and even have a number. A few weeks after, the commissioner of police denied that he did not even know about the number. So these are the kind of things. And I quite agree with what the senator said. They only react and respond to issues that interest them. But how can you swore on her to defend and protect lives and properties of citizens from your state and their matter, their issue do not concern you? You don't care whether... Do you, when we buried the mass burial we had last week, there was no government presence. Nobody from Kaduna State Government attended that mass burial. I think those people are nobody. And so, if they don't care about that, how would they care about the number of people I've just mentioned that were kidnapped on the 25th of December, that were kidnapped on, on 26th, and who knows what has happened between yesterday 27 to today 28. So these are the kind of situations we have. We have leaders who don't care about us. We have leaders who don't think about our welfare. We have leaders who turn on the other face if they hear that there's a problem on our side. But they will come out to the media and say things. I was surprised the other day when I saw that uh, one of the presidential aspirant candidate throw the issue of insecurity to my governor to answer when he went to check himself. And I could not just believe myself. This is a man who has not just been, uh, been able to address his insecurity problem in the state and is answering for us. So these are the kind of leadership we get in Nigeria. And we can't just blame them without blaming ourselves. It's only in this country that we think that the man we have elected as governor, the man we have elected as president, the man we have elected as senator, the man we have elected as House of Rep or House of Assembly, he is the one in charge of us. Instead, we're supposed to remind them that we gave them the appointment later. They are there because we have given them the mandate. They are not there to so pretend over us or to be the ones to decide what we do and what we don't do. They are there to do what we have sent them to go and do. But they don't care. That's why whether we are killed, whether we are slaughtered, they don't even care. If they are going to make statements, they will make statements that will further aggravate the situation. Today, Kaduna is seriously divided along religious and along other lines. Why? Because even those in power that are supposed to galvanize support or that are supposed to unite the people so that we work together to fish out criminals are even deliberately dividing us. I shared in one of the media yesterday that, look, Kaduna State had ever experienced a nine year without conflict. For those who sometimes don't think that it has been conflict every day, no. From November 22nd, 2002, there was an effort to ensure that there was no more crisis in Kaduna. And we had a nine-year period of silence. What exactly did we do to achieve those success? What exactly did we do to be sure that there were, there were no other violence, no killing, and all the criminal things we are talking about today? This government is not willing to even reverse and take a look at what we, were, we did right or hear us talking about those success. As far as she's concerned, she knows what to do, and sadly, she's doing nothing. Huh. Uh, Mr. Macri, uh, he's talking about the fact that there seems to be no political will whatsoever. And then once in a while, Nigerians point fingers at security agents and say, oh, well, security agents are not doing their jobs. Uh, um, you know, they only are the whims and caprices of, you know, whoever is in power, whether it be the governor, whether it be the president. Um, but the, let's talk about these men, these gallant fellows who are, you know, in the front lines, especially our soldiers who have somewhat been stretched thin dealing with the issue of terrorism and insecurity across the country, whether it be in the southeast, whether it be in southern Kaduna, or even in the fringes of the northeast of Nigeria. Um, let's talk about their welfare. Let's talk about the, um, you know, the idea of making sure that they're mentally prepared for what they're dealing with. And again, talking about political will, how well kit these men are for the fight that they're fighting, because this is not a normal war, it's a guerrilla warfare. It's nothing um, close to them going to peacekeep in Sierra Leone or in, uh, you know, uh, in Liberia. Um, do we consider, amongst all of the politicking, um, the welfare of these men? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, yeah, addressing the issue of political will, you know, many people will say, oh, the president does not have the political will. Uh, his body language is not telling us much about, you know, what we're doing and stuff like that. But we forget that that political will belongs to the people. 
I think that I will rephrase that to say that Nigerians don't have the political will. Just like Reverend Hyde has said, you know, we are the ones who voted them there. And of course, as long as they are there, they are supposed to do what we ask them. Because we are not practicing a, a, a dictatorship. We are practicing a democracy. But how many Nigerians you know, know that they have a role to play? Because, you know, we read we out there during elections that there's the office of the citizen of the Federal Republic. But how many of us, because you see, every time I talk to people, they say, oh, they have the soldiers, they have the police, they are powerful, they are more powerful than us. If we talk, they will kill us. So how many people you know, have that understanding? I am very happy you raised that issue. You know, in Nigeria today, I can conservatively say that about 70% of Nigerians are illiterate. Illiterate in the sense of not having political education. Many people don't know. Go to the market, go to the road and ask people about politics. What is democracy? Many people don't know. They will tell you that they don't know what is going on. All they know is that uh, there is APC, there is PDP, and there is Labour Party coming, and you know, and that's why even the politicians go ahead and use this, you know, ignorance of the public in campaigning and telling them whatever they like, because if we are in, in an educated environment, people will start asking questions. I say, hey, you, you told us this before. Now this is happening. And you are coming back again to talk to us. Answer it. And they should answer. You know, American president put it succinctly. Thomas Jefferson. He said, democracy itself cannot be effective if majority of the populace are not educated. You know? So here, the market woman, even the way to vote, they don't know how to vote. So what are we? Well, how do we now tell them about intricate policies about security or uh, legislation and other kinds of things? It becomes a very big problem. And that's why I'm saying that Nigerian politicians should spend a lot of their time, a lot of their time in political education because people don't know what is going on. Mm. Let's talk financing of our security forces. I, I recently talked um, uh, about, you know, funding of the police, and it took me back to the, the, the essence of the NSAS protest. It was not just protest against police brutality, but it was also protest against the bad welfare uh, or the short end of the stick that police officers were getting, the poor remuneration, but of course, we saw what happened. Uh, again, how can a person police well if the circumstances in which he finds himself is not even comely? Um, how can a person be fighting for a country that does not necessarily care for it nor its family? These are, and then there's, there are monies that have been voted to the army, to special forces, to the police. And these monies somewhat, some way, find their ways into the pockets of some persons who are, you know, at the top. Uh, and then leaves these other people, you know, in a state of comatose. Hence, they're unable to do their jobs as they should. Why are we yet to address these issues? We have members in the National Assembly who just talk about these issues once in a while, but there is, again, no follow-through. And I'm wondering, where do we as people come in to make sure that these things are addressed so we can have the kind of security and policing that we deserve? It boils down again to security education. You know, it boils down to that. Because when you look at it, even the security agencies are, you know, doing, they are not independent. Remember that. Because the security sector itself needs a very serious reform. You know, it has to be reformed. Because, you know, in, in, in other countries, the, the security sector itself is governed in a way that they are effective, they are, you know, they know what they are supposed to do that relates to the national interest, 
And then, of course, they operate under the rule of law. Now we're talking about a policeman that goes around to, you know, maybe he was drunk or he smoked something, uh, shooting, shooting an innocent citizen. Huh? Why, why? What is that going on? Because they believe the police system has not changed much. Mm. Right from colonial days, they were originally set up. The Alsa Constabulary here in Lagos was set up to take care of colonialists. Mm. And when the colonialists left after independence, we have politicians, Nigerian politicians. And then, of course, the politicians started using them as to protect themselves against uh, the populace. So what are we really talking about? Mm. Are, we, are we running a system that is democratic, that takes care of everybody, or we are protecting the regime in power? You know, so you have to feel very sorry for the security agencies. They are not constitutionally, they are not independent. You know, they are not independent. And if that sector is reformed, reformed, you know, where we have good governance in the security sector, then, of course, they will be independent enough to carry out the job that they are assigned to do. You know, no matter whose ox is God. Mm. Remember, in the United States, they have to go into Donald Trump's house and search him. Because when he left the office, he took official documents away. That cannot happen here because you cannot go. Who is going to give you the order? Mm. You know? So the institutions have to be independent, strong, before we can call it, you know, an active democracy. Well, we're still talking. Do you mind I say something about this, please? Yes, quickly, before we go on a break. Yeah, because do you even understand that many people who work in the different security outfit of Nigeria actually didn't go there because they have passion for the security of Nigeria. They just went in there because they lack job and they need somewhere to get food. Have you seen so many young men who were recruited or who were employed or engaged into SSS? Their desire every day is to be with one politician. And you see every day they are struggling to be with one politician, to open his gate, to block people from shaking hands with him. And then we, who are those ones that are supposed to go out there to gather intelligence and know that there's crime that is about to be committed, there's an evil that is about to be done. The same thing with the police and even soldiers that you expect see some sense of discipline. I'm sorry, I am a son and a product of a military man. I grew up in the past. But I'm just ashamed when I go out and see how those have, who have been recruited or engaged by Nigerians to serve in the security outfit, their desire is just to protect one individual, not about the citizens, not about the country. Look, they were living with lobbying people. Please, can you get me to be with one senator or get me to be with one big man there? Is that the reason why you join the security force? That's why you cannot have proper understanding of their job, or they may not have proper understanding of their job, because their desire is... Let me just be somewhere close to someone who has money and get money, and that's all. Mm. We'll take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about security reporting, and my next question will go to Senator Rebu, who uh, obviously is in the field. Are we reporting properly, or could we also be part of the problem? We're still talking security on Plus Politics. Stay with us.